Hi, everybody. It's me. I'm here with an image of our guest over there in the other square, and we have a reason for doing that. Today on Comic Spot, we're doing an interview with somebody with a very long, wonderful intro. He might get a little sick of hearing about himself, so I let him go on and off camera. Just ignore it. But before we get started with today's last interview of the day, oh my gosh, we got to say thank you to my one and only paid sponsor. You know, don't want to lose my only sponsor, and they're amaze balls. The sponsor's name is ahabroadway.org. That's where you can go to beef up your comedy, your improv, and your acting if you're a child, a senior. And even if you're a veteran, they have classes for veterans for as little as $10 a session. Those comedy classes are offered by Chris Murphy. You can't get more for your money than $10 a session with a real performing working comedian headliner. So check out AHA Broadway for all your comedy and acting needs. Thank you for being a sponsor. So today, with me and my ability to read, which is questionable, I will go into the intro of our Amazeballs guest named Casey Jane. He's over there behind that picture right now waiting. So let me get started. I don't like leaving anything out. If you send me an intro, I want to read it. Casey James found his calling in stand-up comedy while traveling the country as a successful door-to-door -door salesman. He did a short time on the comedy circuit before being hired as the permanent party host at Senior Frogs in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where Casey honed his stagecraft in both English and Spanish. Since arriving back in the U.S., Casey has made his way and built up his network by selling online marketing, ghostwriting, and editing scripts and treatments with HBO's Entourage, season 02 and 03, Dish Network's Drinking Made Easy, Vince Hamilton's Pharmaceuticals, and a movie based on Casey's earlier successful career as a traveling door-to-door -door salesman in the 2016 movie American Honey, where Casey is portrayed by Shia LaBeouf. Booth, LaBeouf, LaBeouf. Anyway, you know who I'm talking about, Shia LaBeouf. LaBeouf. All while building a successful PNW, probably Pacific Northwest Comedy Entertaining Booking Company, Hardcorn Entertainment. Along with his production company, Stoner Eats Productions, Casey then found a home on Satellite Radio's iHeart Radio on the Time 4 Hemp Network as a co-host of The Hollywood Hemptress with Tara Joyce, or it might be Terry Joyce, NBC's last copying standing season number one, one runner-up. NBC's last comic standing season one runner up in 2012. This led to Casey's hosting on his own show on the Time 4 Hemp Network Trips Through Reality and then iHeartRadio Award in 2013 for being the most downloaded and listened to podcast, only coming in second to the World Cup before retiring of air in 2015. Last two paragraphs. Casey has since been behind the scenes working on content produced by and for Stoner Eats Productions, including his new podcast, When the Gloves Come Off. When the Gloves Come Off, an upcoming interactive television show, Ben Fred Savage AF, a blockchain app to release the content, and his own cryptocurrency coin, Dope Coin building the 5013C federally recognized tax exempt nonprofit organization sock em up bringing mixed martial arts sports mixed martial arts sport leagues fighters and athletes together to promote a good personal health and hygiene through the donation of the distribution of fresh clean new socks for those in need as socks are number one requested items in homeless shelters and other low income programs while being in the, the being the items least donated. Happy feet means happy peeps. Casey James has been described as a hard headed, 
independent philanthropist with an open mind, a free thinker who loves to learn and educate others, who's willing to challenge status quos and sometimes downright argue to get to the point. You can get, you can check out Casey James and go trip with him on trips through reality on the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network or When the Gloves Come Off by Stoner Eats Production LLC. You can you can catch Casey's shows and work on I that work on High Heart Radio, iTunes, Spotify, Speaker, SoundCloud, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all other forms of social media. We have a winner for you today. He's quite the mix, as you heard. He's done a lot. So I would like to take this amazing opportunity to stop talking and give him a chance to talk. Welcome to the stage, the amazed balls, Casey James. Hey, how's it going? Hot diggity dog, thank you for coming. It's going great. How's it for you? It's uh it's amazing. It's really good, actually. Awesome. So you were a host in Puerto Vallarta at Senior Frogs. Yes. And I lived there for seven months in 2005. Nice. And I went there. Were you co- were you hosting at that time? That would have been, let me see. So, no, I would have been gone already. I was there um, between 2000 and 2003. I had so much fun at Senior Frogs. That's a great place to go and catch comedy. It was it was an amazing opportunity, just random. And, you know, we went in there. We were there on vacation for two weeks. And we went in there on, like, the third day we were there um, at breakfast time. And uh, we, we sat upstairs as, like, like, a tiered thing. And we were eating while the floor was full of nothing but um, a bunch of Navy uh, a bunch of American Navy personnel, as it's a big port the ships were in, and they were doing a huge party thing, and the guy on stage was doing something, and he wanted to do a drinking contest, and if some whoever he picked out of the crowd won, everybody got a free bucket of beer. We totally were ignoring him, and he picked me, which I got booed, and at that point, I was like, no way. I got kind of like, I have to do this for America, you know, and, <laughs> and, and um, I got down there, and um, I did it. I ended up slamming a fifth of tequila in like 90 seconds and um running off the stage which I didn't make I it was bad I had it came back up and it came out of anywhere it could (laughs) uh, (laughs) um, uh, afterwards after I had gotten cleaned up maybe about a half hour in the bathroom and gotten everything got together um I went back up stairs and um my food had gotten there and was cold already but they replaced it they gave me the meal for free and the guy who was the actual host at the time came over and started talking to us. He's like, I've been doing this for years. I've never had anybody win that. Like, they give you cheap mezcal, and he's got some dyed colored sugar water, right, in his bottle. And it's whoever can drink it first. And, you know, and then they got in trouble because they didn't want to give everybody a bucket of beer. They wanted to give each table a bucket of beer. And so that turned into a big thing with the, all the, you know, military guys and whatnot. And, um, they ended up asking me, they were like, hey, he was like, hey, do you speak Spanish? Do you want a job? And it was just like that. Like, do you want to do this? He met, a, he met a woman and got married to a woman from Canada that was there on vacation off of a cruise ship. And he wanted to go to Canada and they weren't going to let him uh, until he found a replacement. And so he just happened to choose me because I beat him in a drinking contest. It was weird. My and gosh. it went just like that. And I, so I jumped on. I was like, yeah, why not? <laughs> You accomplished a lot while you were at Senior Frogs, because that's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that yeah. really, that gate, that was your first time doing comedy, right? No. Um, so oh. I had just, I, uh, my very first time was an open mic um, at the Tempe Improv um, in Arizona. And the only reason I went is because I went, I was actually attending um, ASU at the time. And although I didn't live in the dorm rooms, I had my own place in Arizona. I was supposed to be my freshman year living in the dorm room. So I had a dorm room. And um, being a broke college student, I found out and underage 
I found out that they would give me beer if I went and did three minutes on the open mic night. As long as I drank it backstage, I could get two beers. So I was like, sweet, sign me up. <laughs> and um, not even knowing what I was doing, I went and did my three minutes. I couldn't tell you what came out of my mouth. Most of the time when I do stand-up comedy, I can't, I can write a whole set and have it memorized and ready to go and practice it. But I can't guarantee that's what comes out of my mouth once I get on the stage. Cause it's like, I turn into, it's just like a whole nother person. Yeah. And um, I, I did my three minutes and when I came off stage, everybody was telling me how great I did. And like, I, I was like, really? Like, and um, a, a guy came up to me and asked me if I wanted to go to a party. Uh, and I said, sure. And he said, just hang out here. And a couple hours later, sure enough, he came back in and um, he said, you come in. And we went and got in a limo that said skin across the back window and then vivid on the license plate. And we ended up at a Scottsdale porn party in a mansion. And uh, the guy turned out to be Dave Attell. And what? my very first three minutes doing comedy and partying with Dave Attell, I ended up his, I, the next day I was his opener. Just like that. I didn't even know what I was doing. And I got to give him a lot of credit because um, he helped me quite a bit. Um, he forced me to do a lot of open mics, you know, when we were in different cities during the day and do my show. He taught me how to, you know, like how to write, do other things. He had me take comedy classes. I got comedy classes with like Andy Kindler and a bunch of other comics. I mean, he literally, he, he built me, you know, and I was like, which was weird. And then um, it was me, him and Nick Swartzen and Nick and I do not get along whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. So can I tell you about me meeting Dave Attell? Yes, please do. So I'm with a friend at the olive tree above the cellar in Manhattan. And Dave Attell is at the bar. And I recognize him. So I go up with a camera and I say, Dave, um, you know Gladys Simon. She's my coach. So can I get a picture with you? And he says, all right. And I go, okay, so what I need you to do is act like you really want to be with me, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah. And he, he laughed, and I got a picture of him smiling when I said that to him. Nice. nice. So the next day, I'm clear up by Stand Up New York, which is like in the 70s, I think, or 80s, uh, up, up, up in the city. I'm at a diner and who walks into the diner the next day, Dave Attell. And I go, Dave, am I following you or are you stalking me? Which is it? And he goes, ha ha. And he goes outside and he thinks about it and he comes back in and he says to me, anything you want to get on the menu, I will buy it for you, ma'am. That sounds like Dave. That was so sweet of him. Yeah, he he really is like the weirdest nicest guy like very sarcastic and you can take it the wrong way but don't because he will give you literally give you the shirt off his back he just doesn't care like i mean here i was barely 20 i, I wasn't even 21 years old barely 20 years old fresh back from mexico um you know um you know because i went to mexico first i did actually work at senior frogs um i guess that you know it wasn't my first time doing comedy um but I did hone my craft and, you know, get it down really well there. And now I'm opening for Dave Attell and he's got me doing comedy classes and just giving me the world, you know, and, um, but, you know, it turned out kind of bad though, because we were on tour and um, I actually signed a contract with Happy Madison Productions. And this is in the early 2000s, like, and um, I, at the end of the tour, I was supposed to go to New York, um, meet up, you know, meet up with them and join this production team and I didn't because I met a girl on the road and I actually left the tour two days before the tour ended oh. and ran away with, with this girl and um yeah but what ended up happening was is, uh, my real name my actual real name I no longer owned the rights to because it was part of the contract and now a, another celebrity uses my real name as his pseudonym. And so I had to change. I had to literally change my name. I didn't legally change it. I just 
started I just started filling everything out like differently. <laughs> it was weird. So you're not even allowed to say what your real name used to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my real name is Kevin James. That's what I used to go by was Kevin James, which is now the King of Queens and also a well-known Happy Madison production member. <laughs> wow. Yeah. They, so he got my name. And because that's not his real name, obviously. And uh, I, my real name was Kevin James and my last name was Corn, C-O-R-N. Um, and if you ever watch like, you know, Entourage and you see the first two seasons or even the movie, you'll see credit for James Corn because I had dropped Kevin and used James Corn for that. And then when I started doing stand up again, I just took the K from Kevin and the C from Corn and made, and then wrote Casey James. And wow. that's how I came to that which is weird because on my instagram i actually have it as casey james but my qrc code when they originally gave it to me when you clicked on it took you to the other kevin james's profile oh my gosh holy <laughs> toledo yeah um but this is why me and nick don't get along um so nick didn't like me right off the get um he didn't think that i should be there he didn't think i earned it like i hadn't like who like this guy does comedy for three minutes and now he's like here on this level um and he didn't like the fact that dave was spending a lot of time you know you know teaching me like and you know i don't know he was he's a weird character um and i was oh i was obviously like hosting opening right he was featuring and then dave was headlining and then one time in the middle of the, the thing dave was like i want him to feature you open and host and that really made him mad and so he did but when he went out he did my entire set he memorized it like and did it and then called me up on the stage and as I went by he's like have fun like I'm supposed to do 30 minutes of not knowing what like having to just wing it and I did I made it through it right but it just caused uh, you know more problems between us and then when I left the tour and um, at the, the end date of the tour, when they came, when they had sent the representatives to come get me or whatever, and I wasn't there, they actually took Nick instead. He basically, according to Dave, he basically jumped up and said, I can do it. I know all his material, blah, 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 which I can't even argue with because I've seen a good portion of like character bits, um, my material. And what's really funny is his personal website is almost identical to my old MySpace page. Oh my like the way he filled it out. I used to, I had my MySpace page said for a profession, I was a professional high fiver. That's what it says he, his profession is on his webpage. I mean, all the way down to the T, he basically just, just throwing this out there guys, Nick Swartzen. <laughs> and um, he went on, in, you know, and signed to Happy Madison Productors and then got his first role um, as Rollerblade Terry on Reno 911. I gotta, I gotta say, you know, like, you see that stuff go down, David Tell, you should do something about it, not let him run Russia. He called me instantly, he called me when, it, you know, like, right after it happened, um, and let me know, because, I mean, I dear chonned him, I met this girl at, at a show, and brought her back to the hotel, and told everybody I was gonna marry her, and I was running away with her, and they thought they're like, whatever, and um, I ended up writing on a pizza box, sorry guys, I took off and I did I, I ended up marrying her and having two children with her oh wow that's cool. um, so that takes us up to what year oh wow well so now we're at like two that we're about 2005 now and then what happened in your life um I well I at that point I still I owned a business so even though I lived in Mexico I had a I owned a business in America um I had started traveling going door to door doing door to door sales when I was 15 years old and um now by 2005 I owned my own crew right my own you know I own uh, my own business doing it and um I still had that operational so I went and joined you know at one point I went and joined back up um you know went back and you know went and started teaching employees and whatnot like how to do you know and do things and just make sure everything was running smoothly and that turned into just awkwardness because we were in Santa Monica. I'll never forget it. I was in Santa Monica, California. And I took a trainee to a door in this lockout building, which, you know, you have to follow people in just to get in. And, you know, you just pick a floor. And the first door I happened to knock at like 930 in the morning, 
um, opens up and the guy kind of opens it up and he looks hungover. Like he doesn't look like he's feeling well at all. Uh, and he just goes, uh, come in and walks off, like leaves the door open and keeps walking. So I'm like, okay, so who we walk in and there are, you, you walk down this hallway and it opens up on the left is like the kitchen with a little island you can see over into the living room. And then on the right it had two bedrooms and a bathroom. And this guy went into a bedroom, he disappeared, but there were bodies all over the living room floor, just passed out. People were sleeping. And I look in the kitchen and there's like plastic cups, bottles of, I mean, you can tell they partied hard the night before. And all of a sudden I turn around and the guy who had gone in the room comes back out and he's taking a Polaroid picture of me. Snap! Which like, I turned into it and that kind of creeped me out. Like, what is that? Like, and he was like, oh, check this out. And he takes me back in the room and the entire walls in the room were lined with Polaroid pictures of people. And he was like, this is everybody who's came through that door, the front door. And I was like, crazy. I was like, anybody famous? And he's like, yeah, tons of famous people. And he's like showing them. And he goes, you know this guy? And he points at a picture. And I have no clue who this guy is. Nope. And he goes, that's Adrian Grenier. And I said, who? He goes, the devil wears Prada, Entourage. And I was like, never heard of it. Never heard of him. Oh, well. He's out there on the couch. So whatever you're selling or doing, wait for him to wake up. That's the dude I would talk to just like that. And so I'm like, huh, okay. Like, I still don't know who this guy is. Like, you know, and I walk out and um, everybody's sleeping. So I'm, you know, trying to be respectful and, talk, you know, tell him the guy who's with me, like the trainee, just be quiet. Like, just sit here and watch. And I just go into the kitchen and help myself. Like, might as well mix myself a drink while I'm here, right? Like, <laughs> but, you know, so I start drinking and um. About half hour goes by and you know people start moving and waking up in the living room and, and before you know it they're all awake and talking and laughing and you know it's been about 45 minutes and they realize who's the guy in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> um so they realize me and i didn't even think it was the same guy in the polaroid because he's got this just crazy afro this like huge be full beard not like no he wasn't clean shimmy it was just that you know he just it's crazy. And I, he looked like a beach bum, honestly. Like, he didn't look like the Adrian Grenier that you see now, right? Or, yes. you know. And, and um, Gosh. I end up immediately going into the spiel, selling magazines. You know, nobody wants them. I'm, you know, and I just keep doing my thing. And finally, Adrian goes, I tell you what, I'll buy some. Check it out. And this is what he ends up doing. He gives me the keys to his car and an ATM card with a PIN number. And says, go get the cat. Go get what you need. Come back. And I'm like, okay. And so crazy. I'm like, this is crazy. So now I'm down below this building in the garage, pressing, bu pressing the button the, 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 to find out what car it is. And he's got this really super nice car and I get in it. Now here I am with this trainee. We're driving down Santa Monica in, in, in this car. And I got this, this debit card with a pin number, right? And I like, what do I do? And I stopped because I used to skateboard a lot. And, you know, the very first skate shop ever is there, like, in America, like, is there. And so I stopped, went in there, looked at stuff. And I did not purchase anything. I didn't use the card. I didn't do any, you know, I did look at stuff. And then, you know, I hit the ATM. I pulled out the exact amount that I, you know, that I said that we, it was agreed upon. With got the receipt. We got back in the car and I went and I took it back. When we got back there, I explained, I didn't take anything, do, 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 blah, 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 I'm sorry, it took so long, yada, yada. and he goes, how was, and he asked me how the skate shop was, so he knew where I was, and where I went in his car the whole time, and I apologized, I said, hey, man, I used to skate, I had to check out the store while I was right there, it's the only time I'm gonna get a chance to do it, I was like, I didn't spend any of your money, do, do, do. I didn't use anything of yours, I didn't steal anything, like, he's like, no, 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 I'm aware of that, and he goes, um, I, and then he told me he heard I was funny, See, um, so at the time I was doing like, you know, the three, four in the morning spot, the comedy store, you know, <laughs> that front stage, you know, in that little stage where you get the early morning slot because, <laughs> um, you know, I wasn't up the car or whatever. And um, he said that his buddy had seen me about a week ago there, at like three, four in the morning. It turned out it was the guy who took the Polaroid picture of me. So when he opened the door, he recognized me without even telling me. What? That's yeah. crazy. It was the whole thing was crazy. And so we're sitting there. I go, I'm I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about because I used a completely different name when I went door to door. I didn't use my pseudonym, my real name, anything, you know. Um, and 
So we start talking and out of nowhere, he gets on the phone and makes like a reservation for like 200 people at Nobu, which at the time was like the most, like was the restaurant in California and impossible to even get in, let alone just call and make a 200 person reservation. Absolutely. Right? Yes. And then he was like, well, we're all going to know. And I'm like, all right, wait. I'm like, later, like, I'm ready to check myself out. And he's like, aren't you coming with? I was like, oh, I can't afford that. And he goes, oh, I'm paying. He's like, it's all good. He's like, he's like, you're coming, like, come with us. And so we go. And next thing you know, I'm sitting with all these people at Nobu. And like, most of them are the cast from Entourage, Mark Wahlberg and his Entourage. And just, and I'm sitting next to the weirdest guy who was part of Mark Wahlberg's entourage, who kept saying the weirdest stuff to me. Like, and it actually, it actually, and I'm, I'm game. Like, I'm cool. Like, I can handle, but it actually started actually kind of weirding me out. Like, like, is this guy serious? Like, and then out of nowhere, people are like, well, who are you? Like, you know, I mean, and Adrian's like, oh, this guy, he's going to be one of our new writers. I'm bringing him on. Like, just like that. Like, like, it's if he has the pull to do that, and he did, apparently. Because two days later, I'm on a lock in a writing room, having absolutely no clue what I'm doing. Wow. You've and, had uh, a magical, magical career. Yeah. you just, It's just, my whole thing is, is like, if, if doors open, don't be afraid to walk through them. Jump head. I, I'll dive head first. Fake it till you make it, you know? Wow. Uh, I tell myself I'm the best at everything I do, even though I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> No better way to learn than to just jump right. I've always been a leaper. Some people are creepers. I'm a leaper. I'll jump in and do a podcast. Why not? So, yeah. so, what, if, so what if I'm 70 years old? Who cares? Yeah. And it, and then from there, the it just got even weirder. So like um, HBO almost went bankrupt after the first season of Entourage. It was after The Sopranos had ended. They put all their money into Entourage. The first season did not do well at all. Okay. Um. And they were about to have to, they were like, so basically it was do or die for season two of Entourage. Either this is going to do what it needs to, or we're all out of work and HBO is selling to like Turner Networks or something. And so we had to, on day one, go and do, write a season treatment. Each person had to write like a season two treatment. And I have no idea what I'm doing, nor have I even seen the show. <laughs> so they end up giving me the dvd you know for the, you know the season one and tell me to go home watch it and then come back with my treatment the next day like i'm like this is insane so what's really even funnier is i did and mine was the one selected out of the whole writing group i ran with but here's what people don't understand i copied season one <laughs> like i didn't know what i was doing so i just I just changed a couple of things, but like, so if you watch season two um, with season one, like ep season one, episode one and season two, episode one, that, that, they're the same episode. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're pretty much, I mean, the dialogue's different, right? You know, I changed some things, but like season one, episode one starts with them landing in LA on the plane. Season two, episode one starts with them landing on the plane in LA. Like the whole thing was just, you know, and then I had ideas for the characters that I wanted to really explore. Like season two is where you really get into meeting Ari. Um, you know, the the the, the Nega agent who is, is one of my favorite characters, like that I've you know not only written but I used to do like bits like that. Um, Nick actually copied it in one of Adam Sandler's lesser known movies where he plays his like agent manager. That you know, the one with him in it where, where Adam Sandler plays his twin sister. I, I don't remember the name of it, but Adam Sandler plays two roles. He plays his own twin sister. It's weird. Um, but Nick plays his agent and plays the same character, basically, as Ari, which was fun. Meeting Jeremy Piven and all those guys and just having it. And they actually went with it, and it, it was crazy. So I actually wrote season two um, through four, but during season three was the big Hollywood writers union, um, you know, where everybody went and rioted, or, you know, protested, yep. you know, yep. because that, you know, we, that we weren't getting paid enough. Personally, I was happy just being there. <laughs> you know, I was getting paid just fine. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I didn't want to, but we weren't because it's all unionized. We weren't allowed back on the lot. Like I'll still come to work. I don't care. And when it all was said and done, we didn't have jobs to go back to really, you know, um, 
And then what happened is they took, if you look now, season three of Entourage is double the amount of episodes than any other season. Because later they took season, they took the season four we had written and just made it like a second half to season three. So now season three is basically two seasons long out of nowhere. And then you go into a season four later. Um, so I base I only get credit for two through three. But oddly enough, I also get credits um, and I sometimes I get even back end money for things from, um, uh, you know, the Larry David show, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and a couple other things that HBO has taken things that they must still have that I wrote that I don't even know about that they used. Yeah. And they're really good about, you know, paying me. So, I mean, it pays my child support, which is amazing. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. So in all the things you've accomplished that I read in your bio intro at the beginning, what has been the most delightful, surprising, wonderful thing? Or is that too hard to pick? No, um, no, not at all. So uh, I'm friends, you know, I had made lots of friends with other comics and whatnot. And I knew a bunch. And uh, one of my friends was a, um, a female comic named, uh, well-known named Terry Joyce. Um, she was on the first season of NBC's Last Comic Standing, runner up, every, and she did really well. And then she went on to become famous as the Hollywood Hemptress. Um, and she went viral um, with a photo from one of the raids that they had done uh, on a dispensary before, you know, marijuana and that, you know, had gone legal. Um, she was wrapped in this because she lived above the dispensary in an apartment and she came out basically naked or topless and wrapped in like a, it wrapped in the American flag. And the cops took the picture and it went in and it made like the cover like Rolling Stone, like it was just huge. Um, and she blew up and she had her own TV show at the time called The Hollywood Huntress. And she had me on as a guest with Guar, which was totally weird. The band Guar. Um, they're cool guys, but just they're out there. <laughs> and uh, um, that was just fun. And, you know, we just had like a normal thing. And her that show had the highest ratings out of any show she had ever done. And so she also had a podcast, like a radio show on iHeart that went with it. And the person who did the TV show, who owned the network basically, called me and asked me if I would be Terry's co-host. And I said, is Terry aware of this? And he said, no, but she's not getting the ratings she needs. You did. Wow. So um, you're either on or you know she's off. And I said, well, that's not how this works. You know, like you're gonna have to run that by Terry, or you know, have to have Terry talk to me. Like I don't, you know, yes. I'm not doing that. That's not cool, right? Good I don't, for you. I'm not Nick. <laughs> so, no. um, uh, so six months of this guy calling me every day. Um, six of uh, for six months, I, he called me twice a day, trying to get me on his network. And finally, after six months, Terry called me almost in tears, and said that they were gonna cancel her shows. She first she asked if I would like to come on as a co-host, as a guest co-host, and then co-host, and then she almost broke down in tears and basically told me if I didn't, they were going to cancel her show. And I said, well, if you want me to and you need me to, I will. I have no idea what I'm doing, you know. Um, but you know, if you, uh, but I will, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, I'll, I'll you know help you out. And it wasn't like I was getting paid; it was totally, you know, free. And um, so I did. And it just skyrocketed at like a quantum level at that point. Like her show ratings went through the roof. Um, I was, anything I did, like whether on like on social media, oh, do, 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 I was going through a roof. My entertain, my booking entertainment company was getting booked out everywhere. Like it just went absolutely crazy right out the gate. And, um, you know, after about almost a year, eight months to a year of this, me and, Ter me and Terry started having some issues. Um, Terry's, I love Terry to death. You know, um, she's one of my really good friends. Uh, but she, if she's hosting a show, she doesn't like it if you're get, becoming more popular than she is or, you know, if things were. And so we started having, you know, she would start purposely causing conflict. Like almost like an argument, like while in, while while we're like on air, like she would like attack, um, or say really weird things, like you know, um, and 
I just, you know, I ended up calling the network owner saying, I can't do this. Like, I love Terry. I don't want it to go any further. Like, I just, I'm going to have to step away. And he said, nope, you're getting your own show and you can have her time slot. And I said, nope. I go, you can give me my own show and I'll take the hour after her hour. And, yeah. you know, we negotiated that and he said, okay. And I got my, and I ended up doing my own show. Um, within eight, nine months of doing it, I was on iHeartRadio with my own show. And this is at a time when iHeartRadio was big, like Sirius and XM were still different. It was just the, the three, Sirius, XM, and iHeartRadio. That was pretty much it, right? And um, so, and my hours, which was weird, um, actually went from, so I was still, I still co-hosted her show, which was 10 to 11. And then I, uh, you know, which actually is more like 10 to midnight because there's all, you know, everything else you do after the show to, get to, to push it. And then, um, and the editing, I then I would do midnight to basically two, right? AM, ah. an hour long show somewhere in there. And this was prime time over in Europe and Colombia. Like we were their morning drive, like to work like 7 AM, 8.30. It was more their morning show. And we blew up. My show just went through, and it was called Trips Through Reality, um, which actually was a TV show I was pitching at the time. Uh, I was I I had come up with this idea that I needed a television, you know, production company to fund my next comedy tour. And I was going to take we were going to put three comics in a tour bus and drive around country and do shows by night. But by day, we could eat and drink for free because we'd film this TV show about all the local restaurants and bars or what, you know, alcohols. And, um, and it, it, the original idea had actually started called Trips to Reality because I actually wanted to do it with indigenous drugs all over the world. Like, send us all over, we'll do their drugs, and then you can have us interview people or talk, and it'll be absolutely insane. <laughs> um, and that was the idea. And the legalities and just the things behind it, nobody would touch it at the time. <laughs> yeah. so, we, so I toned it down to like, what if we just did it in-house in the United States and we just did drinking and food? And they were like, oh, great. And I ended up selling it to um, Jeff Cuban, Mark Cuban's brother. He was the program director for um, Dish Network on uh, Dish Satellite TV Services, which is now Access TV, a music station. Um, and I sold it for $10,000 with the idea, right, that I was going to be in it. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is another contract lesson I learned. Um, that was not the case. Um, and they went with um, Dane Cook's opener, Zane Lamprey. <laughs> And they took Zane Lamprey and they changed the title to Drinking Made Easy. Oh my gosh. And it went on for three or four seasons um, and made a ton of money, especially in the brandizing and merchandise department. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got, like I said, I got an initial 10 grand out of the whole thing, like for, you know, giving them the pilot and the rights. Um, although I, I have, I, you know, I'm not mad at them. I actually have a really good working relationship with Jeff and that guy will green light me for anything I want to do now. Like he'll, he'll, he'll hand me $10,000 and green light me to make a pilot like any, at any point, because that show did so well, because they almost went, they almost lost their network because of the uh, girls gone wild guy. Wow. Because they were airing like girls gone wild and stuff at night. And then that guy got in trouble and went to, and, and all that stuff came out that some of the girls were underage and, Oh, and it was just money, and Mark Cuban was just like, eh, you know, we don't need it. <laughs> it was a um, big deal. Yeah, so, so I'm, I was two for two with television shows at that point for HBO <laughs> and um, them, and then I pitched later on when Vice first start, um, came out, the Vice Network, uh, and they were doing, they went to TV rather than re their reporting, and they went into TV. Um, they actually ran commercials trying to recruit people who wrote television shows like hey if you have a script or do 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 call this number pitch it do 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 and um so i did i called and i pitched it um i got a call back i went to new york i met with them we had a, and they told me they weren't interested and then eight months later they had hamilton's they were airing a show that they made called hamilton's pharmaceuticals where it's this guy going all over the world doing indigenous drugs what that's crazy yeah i was pissed <laughs> I was oh like, my dang it um but Winning that iHeart Radio Award in 2013, where I was the most downloaded thing 
next to the World Cup, which is the most viewed event in the world, um, blew my mind. Wow. I mean, I knew, I mean, I knew it was crazy because the things that were happening, you know, out, you know, outside of it. I mean, we were getting profiled. I mean, I was literally getting followed by the feds. They, they would take, they would, they, and they weren't like secret about it. They would, we'd be out eating and they would sit in a booth across from us and just snap pictures. Like it was weird. Um, you know, I was getting offers to go all over the world and do different things. Um, I was huge. I got so much fan mail out of Colombia, which was weird. Um, from Colombia, they loved me over there for some reason. And the whole thing was just, it was crazy. Like, and I did it. Like, and I went and did it for a few years before. I don't think people realized how much work it was. Um, granted, I had two co-hosts, a board op, produced. You know, I had a bunch of people that helped. But I was so anal retentive about it that I wrote every single show. The wow. breaks, the clip, I, you know, I found the clips every day, right? Um, and I did that five days a week for a few years. Wow. And I just ended up burning out. Like, it was just like, I got to stop. And so I went well, I need to- I need to cut this short within five minutes. So I oh, want to sure. give you a five minute warning. And I want to, I want to know, Fast forward to like lately, where are you tell me what you're up to, where can people find you? You get five minutes uh, awesome. to tell us everything lately. So right now, um, I, you know, I've been, you know, I have my entertainment company. I still book and produce comedy shows. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time. Um, What's the name of your entertainment company? It is Hardcorn Entertainment. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, so I'm do I've been doing that, but I've recently in 2018, I got contacted by iHeart again and they asked me if I wanted to come back on as my show was getting popular again. Like it was like people were downloading. I was like, I told them no, but I they made me do um they had me do special correspondence and report. And so I went and started got got sent all over to do events and just meet people, hang out with people and you know, just interview them, which was fun. Um and then uh when they were trying to get me to go back on air they ended up agreeing to give me my own channel and station so i spent all of 2019 putting that together and the first week of march 2020 we threw our grand launch party at the bossa nova ballroom in downtown portland with the trailer park boys just so five days later we could go on lockdown and I, uh, get, I could get a letter from i uh, iheart saying that everything had been scrapped and, and the verbiage was indefinitely Oh, gosh. which was not so that was is if being on lockdown the whole COVID thing wasn't stressful enough then people are rioting all around where I was at and now here I am I basically almost bankrupted myself for the last year taking no payment going and putting this together because I had you know I mean I had to find other people's shows you know that you know I mean I had to fill airtime three 365 days a week 24-7 um, and I had some big name people and shows that I'd gotten, you know, and like that I had been able to put together. It was great. And then it was all gone. So just recently I decided I'm going to do it again. So I, we started doing a new, um, show and podcast called when the gloves come off. And, um, within a week we got picked up by iHeartRadio, which was unheard of because you're supposed to have so many episodes to even submit, which was crazy. Um, I'm just kind of, I guess, guess I got grandfathered in or something. And uh, yeah. so we did that. Um, we're back and we just got signed the deal to get our own station again. So we're in the process of, we start our own network called the um, Quantum Global Broadcasting Network. It's called uh, what? Quantum Global Broadcasting Network. Okay. UGBM. <laughs> uh -huh. Um. And then, um, so that, that, that's actually going to go live here in a couple weeks. And then we started another show to uh, correspond um, that we got the rights and the okay from Disney. Uh, or not from Disney, I'm sorry, but Universal. Um, called uh, Fred Ben Savage as Fuck, or AF. Um, and basically, it was supposed to be a Mystery Science Theater 3000 type show where we watch Wonder Years and Boy Meets World. Universal was cool with it for the Wonder Years. Disney was not for Boy Meets World. And we went through some battles um, and they are not going to let us do it. However, there is a new season, a new show and remake of the Wonder Years starting th this month. 
Um, and so we had to pivot. And now we're doing just the Wonder Years, but we're going to be doing season one, episode one of the original Wonder Years with season one, episode one of the new Wonder Years. Wow. Um, uh, in a humorous, it, it's, and it's all interactive as you can actually join the room, watch what? along and talk in the chat room. And, you know, we can read, we can see it. So we can answer questions. You can talk and we have, we have guests and special guests that you can come on that you can speak to and all sorts of things. So that's really fun. Look forward to that. That'll be on any platform you want. That's <laughs> uh, so anyway, awesome. So we'll be a file sharing platform here shortly. Um, we will be the day after it airs uh the new show airs so i believe the new one is september 22nd so our pilot episode our first episode will be september 23rd that's so fabulous where that, do you want people on social media to follow you casey wow well you can follow me um you can follow me on facebook um at casey james on facebook if, if, if i'm on there i get banned quite a bit <laughs> they give me 30 day bands like every other couple of days. So I'm rarely on there. Um, you, you can also find me on Facebook Lite, which I call, that's what I call Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find me on Instagram, also under the same name, um, except it's C Kevin James uh, instead of Casey James. Um, you can find me on there. Um, Spreaker, iHeart, <laughs> um, you know, iTunes, any music file sharing uh service that you use streaming service that you use or social media you can pretty much find me um but you can find me um you can also look up my shows you can look up trips through reality when the gloves come off uh ben fred savage af as well uh that's all available they all have pages and web stuff but right now my big thing is we just started a nonprofit. me and my comedy partner called sock em up and we are, we actually got federally recognized as a 501c federally recognized um, national nonprofit, which is awesome. So we are tax exempt and we distribute socks to the homeless or to low income families or disaster areas. I think we're actually be going to Louisiana here in a couple of weeks to do what we do out there. Uh, and we, we want to promote and educate people uh, on good health and personal hygiene um, through foot care, you know. Um, also, we found that socks are the number one requested item and the least donated item. So it, there's, a, there's a need for it. Like there's an actual hole there. Um, and then we call it Sock em Up because we want to actually involve mixed martial arts, sports and athletes um, in this as every major sport has a nonprofit attached except for mixed martial arts. Wow. Um, so football has like, you know, the Susan G. Komen breast cancer awareness. Um, basketball has jerry west foundation baseball lou gehrig's disease and lou gehrig um so we want to go after like ufc pfl bellator and we want to be their nonprofit. wonderful so, way to go yeah. i need i need to cut this short and i want to have you back on because your things are ramp ramping up and i yeah. want you back like in a month or two to give me an update will you give me a date a couple dates and times for me to pick from to have you come back like in Absolutely. Late October. Um, anytime after the September 23rd, I would gladly do it as I will have the new show pilot and shows out and everything should be running smoothly then. So right now I'm in the process of having websites built and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> cool. Well, hit me up with a couple of veils in mid-October early in the day like we're doing. Please. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Casey James. You guys, aren't you impressed? Let's get behind this guy because he's going, he's been going places and he's not stopping. Thank you Never. so much, Casey James. Thank you. Love you lots. You too. Have a great day. Okay, bye.